On a quiet morning in March 1905, Thomas and Ann Farrow, a shopkeeping couple in their 60s, were discovered brutally murdered in their shop of Deptford, South London. Thomas, known for his amiable nature, managed the shop while Anne tended to the household. Their peaceful life was shattered when neighbors, alarmed by the absence of the usual morning activities, alerted the authorities. Upon entering the premises, the police found a scene of horror. Thomas lay dead in the shop, his head brutally struck, and Anne, barely alive upstairs, succumbed to her injuries shortly after being found. The shop had been ransacked, and the day's takings were missing, suggesting robbery as a motive. The investigation into the Faro murders was groundbreaking for its time, marking one of the first instances where forensic science played a key role in solving the crime. The police found a bloody fingerprint on the cash box, which became a key piece of evidence. Despite the limited technology of the era, fingerprint experts were able to match the print to Alfred Stratton, one of two brothers known to the police for their criminal activities. Alfred and his brother Albert were arrested, marking one of the first significant achievements of criminal detection in the burgeoning field of forensic science. The trial of the Stratton brothers was a sensation, drawing public and media attention to the innovative use of fingerprint evidence. The defense argued against the reliability of the new forensic method, but the evidence was compelling. The jury found both brothers guilty for the murders of Thomas and Ann Farrow, heralding the importance of forensic science and bringing some semblance of peace to the community that was shattered by the Farrow murders. I'm Zach Kowalski, a forensic detective, and this is my partner Bonesworth. Today, we're talking about fingerprints, how and why they're unique, and how among the billions of people on the planet, only you have the unique patterns on the tips of your fingers. Not even if you have an identical twin do you share the same unique details of those patterns. Loops, swirls, arches, these are patterns that are left behind by the simplest of touch and they've been used for their uniqueness for thousands of years. Today we uncover the intriguing journey of fingerprints in forensic science, a tale that spans centuries across continents, shaping the very fabric of criminal investigations. Our story begins in ancient times. In Babylon, fingerprints sealed deals, while in ancient China they authenticated documents hinting at their uniqueness. As we fast forward to the 19th century, the era of pioneers. Herschel and Folds were early visionaries. They glimpsed the potential that fingerprints held. And as Sir Francis Galton enters the scene, he's a man ahead of his time. Galton recognized that each fingerprint is unique, a tool waiting to be harnessed. Sir Edward Henry brings order to the chaos, and he introduces the Henry classification system. With this system, we can catalog fingerprints for identification. Then there's a groundbreaking moment in Argentina in 1892. Juan Vucidich matches the first fingerprint. The first positive identification of a criminal was made in 1892 when Frances Rojas killed her two children and then cut her own throat in an attempt to put the blame on an outside attacker. A bloody print identified her as the killer. Argentinian police adopted Vucidich's method of fingerprint classification and the method spread to police forces around the globe. Progressing into the 20th century, the FBI adopts fingerprint classification and embraces the field. They end up forming a database that is able to compare crime scene to known offenders. And then as we enter the digital age, everything changes. APHIS, or the Automated Fingerprint Identification System, starts connecting an entire network of fingerprints. With this, no print goes unnoticed. Fingerprints now guard our digital world and you probably use them every day, whether it's on your phones or entering into locks. But fingerprint science isn't without its challenges. Controversies remind us of the need for accuracy and justice, and it is constantly debated in the courtroom. So from ancient seals to digital locks, fingerprints remain a testament to our unique identity, a bridge between science and justice. This is the story of fingerprints an imprint on the world of forensic science. So how are fingerprints formed? The general pattern of whorls, loops, arches, these are influenced by genetic factors. 
And while the genetic code doesn't necessarily dictate the specific pattern of a fingerprint, it does influence the overall development of skin ridges on fingers. Fingerprints begin forming around the 10th week in pregnancy and are completely formed by the end of the first trimester. This process happens in the basal layer of the epidermis or the outermost layer of the skin. You see, the basal layer grows faster than the other layers of skin and this disproportionate growth leads to stress and compression resulting in the formation of ridges. The exact pattern of the ridges is influenced by factors such as the position of the fetus, the density of the ambiotic fluid, and the pressures exerted on the fingers against the uterine wall or other parts of the fetus's body. As a result of these environmental factors, the skin forms unique ridges and patterns. These patterns are what we recognize today as fingerprints. You see, the ridges, they help with increasing friction and better grip and provide a sense of touch, so it allows me to hold on to things. Even identical twins who share the same DNA have different fingerprints because of the different conditions experienced by the fetus within the womb. Once formed, these ridges remain essentially unchanged for a person's life. They can get slightly worn down or scarred, but the overall pattern remains consistent. And this makes fingerprints an excellent tool for identification. You see, there are a variety of different ways to collect fingerprints. And we see a bunch of them on TV, right? And how'd you get over there? Huh. Anyways, so this is my fingerprint kit. This was the first fingerprint kit I ever used at work. And uh, so it's got a little bit of sentimental value. On TV, we see investigators using fingerprint brushes, right? And these fingerprint brushes are where we dip them into powder and we are dusting a surface for fingerprints. And what we're doing is we are adhering that powder to the top layer of that fingerprint. So the fingerprint powder is sticking to the sebaceous oils of those fingerprints. So we're using the powder to develop latent prints. A latent print is one that you can't see with the naked eye. A patent print is one that you can, so that's like a bloody fingerprint on the ground, right? Or on uh, the table. So fingerprint powder is just one methodology of looking for hidden fingerprints. And powders come in a variety of different colors, right? So like this one has some orange on it. This was a fluorescent powder that I used. Um, but we have black fingerprint powder. We've got this silver blend called biochromatic. And the idea is that the fingerprint powder color is to provide us the best contrast against the surface that the fingerprint is on so that we can more easily visualize that fingerprint. There are some other ways other than fingerprint powder though to develop fingerprints. We can use uh, super glue and uh, we did a video on that. Um, so I'll, I'll leave a link so that you can see that video. And in that methodology, we're using the gas of super glue to adhere and polymerize on the fingerprint. But then there's other chemical applications like ninhydrin or 1,2-indanadione. Indanadione, man, that is a mouthful to say. So ninhydrin or silver nitrate. There's a variety of different chemical applications that you can do depending on the type of surface that the print is on. It makes a big difference if it is on a hard, non-porous surface versus a porous surface like paper. Powder is not going to really work that well on something like paper. Uh, that we could use uh, magnetic powder. And that's where we're using a magnet and a special uh, type of powder to kind of go across the ridges that way. Um, but that only works so long as that the print hasn't absorbed into the porous surface. But by the time that I end up getting it, it has well absorbed into that surface. So chemical application and development is actually the most sensitive way to develop fingerprints. I prefer it way more than traditional powder methodologies. Fingerprint powder gets everywhere. It's like sand. So once we've developed the fingerprint with powder or some type of chemical, we need to recover it. The first thing I always do is I photograph it. I photograph it with a ruler or a scale and that image is gonna be the best version of that fingerprint I really am gonna get because I'm getting it before I start to try and recover that fingerprint off of the surface. That's inherently gonna cause some loss of detail. So let's take, for example, fingerprints that I've developed on this cup. 
how do we get them off? Well, first we're gonna take a picture. So we take a picture and then we're gonna use tape. So we take our tape and we're going to put it on one end and we're gonna apply it across that fingerprint. The trick is to take your time and lots of practice. So once we've lifted the print off, we're gonna take a backing card. It kind of looks like an index card. Uh, and we're going to, once again, start on the side and we're gonna slowly apply that fingerprint onto that backing card. And so then there, we have our fingerprint on our backing card and we would fill out all of the detail on this side. So what the case number is and all that kind of information. Uh, and then submit this for a latent print examiner to compare against any known source. Or we can submit it to the fingerprint database or what was formerly known as the Automated Fingerprint Identification System or APHIS, but is today now known as the Next Generation Interface, NGI. And that's the FBI's National Fingerprint Database. And that database comprises of millions of fingerprints from millions of people whether they were arrested or provided their fingerprints during civil records, we can then take the image either from the photograph that we took of the fingerprint or a scan of our fingerprint lift and compare that against all of those millions of fingerprints using a special algorithm. So that's kind of a quick look at how fingerprint powder processing works and how you lift a fingerprint off of a surface. I'll do another video that goes a lot more in detail and shows more of a step-by-step -step, uh, of this particular process. But there's a good chance that you use fingerprint technology every day with the biometric locks on your cell phone or on your electronic devices. It's that same uniqueness that has solved some of the most prolific crimes. In the aftermath of the tragic train bombing in Madrid, Spain in 2004, fingerprint evidence played a critical role in identifying several of the perpetrators. A latent fingerprint found on a bag of detonators helped investigators trace the attack back to an Islamist terrorist cell, leading to numerous arrests and convictions. This one is actually a really unique case that you should dive into even more because of um, some of the issues that played along with the fingerprint evidence in this particular case. Lastly, there's the Green River Killer case. So Gary Ridgway, known as the Green River Killer, was arrested in 2001 for a series of murders in Washington state. Thanks in part to fingerprint evidence collected from the belongings of the victims and matched to Ridgway. This evidence, along with DNA analysis, was instrumental in linking him to the murders of numerous women, leading to his conviction on 49 counts of murder. He's one of the most prolific serial killers in US history. These are just a few examples of how fingerprint evidence is critical in combating crime and solving cases. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you had as much fun as we did, then show us some love and hit that like button and become part of our curious crew by subscribing to the channel. If you found today's video interesting or have ideas for other content that you'd like to see, then let Bonesworth and I know in the comments section below or DM us on Instagram at the science detective. Until next time, I'm Detective Zach. This is Bonesworth. Stay curious. Oh, and did you know that koalas have similar fingerprints to humans? True story.